folks. Um, what, one of the things, one of the habits my wife and I have been trying to do this whole year is starting each day, as we get out of bed, start with this, uh, just this verse. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in this day, and it's going to be a beautiful day. But we try to start the day with that, just a, kind of a connection with God, inviting God to be a part of the day. And if we forget that God's with us the rest of the day, at least we start with that thought. And I just challenge you to, to kind of be thinking of that as a, as a habit for 2023 to just incorporate that into your life. We've been in, in, involved in a series called Love Lives Here. Love lives in this place. Love lives here and here and outside. And then God's call on ordinary people to do extraordinary things. God's call on us. God's calling you and I to do ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And I love how Mother Teresa uh, defines extraordinary. Small things done with great love. Small things done with big love. So we're going to start um, right out this morning. We're going to read the, the, the story, the Jesus comes, the storm story. It's in Mark's gospel, chapter 4 starting with the 35th verse. The verses will be up on the screen, but if you've got a Bible, it's always good to kind of see the context where this, where this story takes place. But this is Mark's gospel, uh, chapter 4, starting with the 35th verse. And I ask you to listen carefully. These are God's words. That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him, and a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped, and Jesus was in the stern. He was in the back of the boat, sleeping on a cushion, and the disciples woke him up and said to him, teacher, teacher, don't you care if we drown? And Jesus got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And Jesus said to his disciples, why, why are you so afraid? And do you still have no faith? They were scared for their lives during the storm. Now they're terrified. And the text says they were terrified and asked each other. Did, they didn't ask Jesus. They asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's four questions in this story, and I'll add one, too. Maybe if, if you're in the midst of the storm, maybe this is a question that you would ask. But there's four questions in the story plus one. And, and if you're taking notes, here's the four questions plus the one from the, from the gospel story. Verse 38, um, this, the storm comes up. Jesus is asleep in the back. Um, they, they, I mean, they're bailing for all they're worth. And um, the, the disciples say, teacher, teacher, rabbi, don't you care if we drown? It's verse 38. Teacher, rabbi, don't you care if we drown? If you're taking notes, care is a key word to the, in that verse. And then verse 40, the first part of verse 40, and, and I, I believe this verse gives us some grace if we're, if we're going through some scary times. Why, Jesus, to the disciples, after he calms the storm, he says, why, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? And just underline so, that's a fill in the blank there. And the second part of verse 40 is, do you still, Jesus, to the disciples, do you still have no faith? Do you still have no faith? They've been walking with Jesus for, for some time now. They've seen a bunch of miracles. They've seen a bunch of healings. They've seen a bunch of, of demons being driven out. But they've never seen something like this. And Jesus says, why are you so afraid? And do you still have no faith? And then verse 41, they, they, again, they, they feared for their lives during the storm. But now after Jesus calms the storm, they are terrified. They are shaken to their core. Jesus, and they say to themselves, not to Jesus, but to themselves, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And here's the plus one, one question. Here's the plus one question. Whose idea was this anyway? Can you imagine the guys in the boat? They're in the boat, especially the fishermen. The storm comes up unexpectedly. Maybe the fishermen know that storms happen. This happens in the Sea of Galilee. Whose idea was this anyway? In the midst of the storms, isn't it oftentimes our tendency, we want to blame somebody? Who can I blame? Whose idea is this anyway? Baptism by fire for the apostles. Apostles, the handful of disciples are following Jesus. So far, before this story, it's been a pre pretty easy walk, a cakewalk. Jesus said, come follow me. And they did. Two sets of fishermen brothers, Andrew and Peter, James and John. They dropped their nets, come follow him. The tax collector, Matthew or Levi, 
He comes, leaves the tax booth, comes Thomas, the doubter, Simon, the zealot, and a handful of other guys. They just, Jesus says, come follow me, and they do. And they've seen some pretty cool stuff so far, four chapters into the story. Jesus, Jesus shows up in the local synagogues, starts teaching with authority like he knows what he's talking about with Shemekah. He starts driving out demons, and the demons are the only ones that really know who Jesus is. Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law and Peter and Andrew's home. Then the floodgates start to happen. Folks start showing up at the back door looking for healing, looking for demons to be driven out. And Jesus heals the leper. Wow, this healing thing seems to be ramping up. Word spreads. Then he heals that paralyzed guy, if you remember the story. Friends, four friends take the paralyzed guy, rip open the roof, lower him down. And Jesus doesn't heal him right away. He forgives this man's sins first. And the Pharisees, they're they're watching this Jesus. They begin to be challenged by this Jesus, threatened by this Jesus. And that's a big no-no in their book. Hey, the only one who forgives sins, that's God. That's God. And we know, wink, wink, this is the Son of God. The Pharisees accuse him of blasphemy. And then then he heals that shriveled hand man on on the Sabbath. Enough, the Pharisees, the Pharisees say, this guy, this guy Jesus is going down. And all this takes place for the most part. And for the most part, Jesus' disciples are taking this all in. It's pretty passive. They're students watching the teacher, studying the teacher, absorbing what the teacher is doing, what he's teaching. Except for the Pharisees, when they get their feathers ruffled, it's been pretty smooth. They've just been walking and talking and watching Jesus. But if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, lately the stories we looked at, it's getting a little bit testy hanging around Jesus. There were the teachers of the law who accused Jesus of, of, of being Satan-like. Yeah, yeah, Jesus is healing folks, but that's Beelzebul. That's the devil healing folks. That's not God. And then Jesus' family shows up thinking he's out of his mind. How can, he's out of his mind. He's gone crazy. Them wanting to straighten Jesus out, Jesus all but ignores them. I mean, there's just this tension, there's this conflict raising up. Then after a day of teaching with parables, these stories that don't make much sense at all, at least on the surface level, now they head out at night across the lake, across the Sea of Galilee. And everyone knows that storms can come up unexpectedly in this area. It's just the way it is around here. Usually not at night, but you never know. And the fishermen, they know. They've, been, they've lived around the water all their lives. They've grown up around here. They, they know, they know, they know better. Just to get an idea about the, the boats that they were in, these were not little rowboats that you and I would rent someplace. These were Galilean fishing boats, probably 26 and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide, four and a half feet deep, could hold up to 15 men in one boat, had four rowing stations and a sail, a main sail and a, and a mast. Picture this, they're rowing along, sailing along. It's dark as dark can be. Stars are out, maybe. Maybe there's some moon. Jesus' direction to them before he goes to sleep in the back, exhausted from the day's work, but at peace, I believe. Jesus' direction, let's get out of here. Let's go over to the other side. The Sea of Galilee is 13 miles long and eight miles wide at its widest point. They start out to the other side. And then suddenly, unexpectedly, the storm comes up. Out of nowhere, wind and waves. I grew up on the water on the east coast, south shore of Long Island, Great South Bay. And I've seen squalls come up out of nowhere in daylight, never mind at night. And this storm comes up at night. Let's assume just for grins, there's several boats. Let's assume for grins, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they're all in the same boat. They're trying to keep things afloat, literally, but the wind and the waves are too much. The waves are breaking over the sides. They're they're taking on water fast, way faster than they can bail. And they know Jesus is exhausted, but they need all hands on deck. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Teacher, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Rabbi, come on, help us. Just a quick, quick point here, at least my take on this story. They're not asking Jesus to calm the storm. He's never done anything like that. They're just asking Jesus to help. Jesus, we need your help. Or this boat is going down. Grab a bucket and help bail. Please, this is serious. And every one of those fishermen are saying, if not out loud to themselves, whose idea was this anyway? um, Ever ask that question yourselves? Whose idea was this anyway? Who can we blame? 
about 10 minutes into my seminary journey, for some of you guys, I was a second career pastor. At 39, I went to seminary, moved, to, moved my family to Columbus, Ohio, my wife and my three-year-old son at the time, 39 years old, approaching midlife crisis, premature midlife crisis, but approaching it. We moved our, my family to Columbus, Ohio to start seminary. And um, we moved 1,000 miles away from family, 1,000 miles away from, um, from our home. And if my wife didn't say it out loud, she was certainly thinking it when we both realized it wasn't going to be a cakewalk to do this seminary thing. Um, whose idea was this anyway? And, and uh, Cindy reminded me the other day that, that what she did say out loud was this, this better be worth it. <laughs> 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 true, true quote. It's son, son of a biscuit, whose idea was this anyway? That quote from Forrest Gump, stupid is as stupid does. Stupid, stupid, stupid. When it gets hard, when the storms get hard, we say that, right? Stupid, stupid, stupid. And the disciples, the apostles, the chosen ones, it's been pretty much an easy street so far. Walking along, following Jesus. Yeah, look at us. We're the chosen ones. We're the chosen ones. And now this crazy storm comes up. In the middle of the night, whose idea was this anyway? And Jesus, in the back of the boat asleep, yeah, you know, it's his fault. Or maybe as they're trying to survive the storm, they go back a little further, especially the fishermen brothers. They begin to bicker. James and John brothers, we should have never left dad. dad. We should have never left Zebedee. Why did we do this? Stupid, stupid, stupid. Or the brothers, Peter and Andrew. Peter, always the impetuous one. In the midst of the storm, Andrew, out of pent-up frustration and fear, dang it, Peter, this is all your fault. Whose idea was this anyway? Who can we blame? Point number two, if you're taking notes. And we all know this. Struggles and storms are going to come. They're going to come. Back in the day when I uh, was doing engineering work up in Rio Blanco County, um, it's, it's cattle country, but it's also deer country. And, we, and the safety guys used to say there's two kinds of people. There are folks who have hit deer, and there are folks who are going to hit deer. There's just, so many, there's just so many deer. But I believe the same thing with storms of our life. We're either in a storm or just coming out of a storm. Whether are in a storm or coming out of a storm. Or one's approaching, right? The storms of life. Uh-huh. Jesus to his disciples, Jesus to us. In this world, we will have trouble. In this world, it's not going to be easy. In this world, we're going to have storms. In this world, we're going to have struggles. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. A couple weeks back, I asked you guys, um, what unsettles you? We were talking about a text where we saw lots of unsettledness. And I asked you guys if you could fill out on a piece of paper and drop it in to our offering basket or drop it at the Welcome Center. And you guys just overwhelmingly gave me responses. We had over 100 responses. And here's just a few of the things that unsettle us. These are all things that came from the, the sheets. Loneliness, aging, future plans, money issues, human trafficking, influx of migrants to our community, anxiety that my family struggles with, especially my wife, my stupid foot, what, what, what unsettles us, how to live with regret, change of routine, misplaced things, fixing things, career path, the lack of friends, the lack of Christian friends, my health, more to do than I seem to have time for. I can never be good enough for God. Eating habits, insomnia, my adult kids not speaking to each other, adult kids struggling with alcohol, alcoholism, and I can't mom it. Unsettled by watching news and what's happening in the world. Unsettled with in-laws. They drive me nuts. Unsettled by my husband's job. Unsettled by my depression. I don't know if I can fake it anymore until I make it. Unsettled about the future of, of this country and the world. Cancer diagnosis. Not being employed. Moms in hospice care. Gun violence. My way or the highway people. What unsettles me when I let people down. When I miss an opportunity. When I don't think outside the box. Relationship with my ex-husband, losing my temper with my kids, seeing my kids struggle, having enough financial resources to live out my retirement, family members with stage four cancer, nerve damage in my left hand, loss of income, my daughter's drinking. What unsettles me, making a change in my life and not knowing if it's the right thing. Am I doing what God wants, not being in control, unsettled when my husband's dementia manifests as meanness to my grandchildren, not knowing if I can handle the worst case scenario. What unsettles me? Failure. Feeling like I don't have what it takes. I'm not enough. The lies of Satan. My grandson rejecting God. Being scared. 
You know what I've learned just from this exercise? What I'm learning is we're all a little scared. Maybe less so when we're together. Maybe less so when we come together as a family. And I'm not a rocket scientist, but there's a lot of unsettledness in and around us in this place. But I believe there's just, this is just a taste of the struggle of the storms that are around us. And these are just storms that are in this place. I know there are storms just outside these walls. Storms that are raging. A bunch of trials that folks are facing. Point number three I want to bring up. Just our first-hand accounts. They give us authority to speak. When we experience the storms, they give us first-hand authority to speak. First-hand accounts. If it's one thing to hear about a situation or a storm or to be watching something on TV. It's another thing to be living in it and through it. A year ago or so now, that Marshall fire, that blew, that, that wildfire that blew into that neighborhood when, the, when it just blew up, just like the, that crazy wind and that fire just blew through those neighborhoods, we can guess how terrifying that was. For most of us, we just watched it on the news a year ago when it happened. But for all those folks who lost homes, or almost lost homes, so, so crazy, so scary, so terrifying. We listed some of the things that you guys are struggling with, and some of those are, are small storms, but some of those were life and death storms. First-hand accounts, you're there. You guys are right there now, feeling it, experiencing it, struggling with it. It's not from TV or a book or in a movie. You're, you're not hearing about it from a friend. You're in it. You're living it. The disciples in these boats crossing the Sea of Galilee at night, that storm comes up unexpectedly. They're taking on water. They're a, long, they're a long way from shore. It's life or death. They're living it, scared, doing whatever it takes for them to stay alive. The importance of firsthand accounts. Late this afternoon, Cindy, my wife and I, get on a plane to fly to San Diego to visit our daughter, Sarah. She's a senior student at Point Loma Nazarene University, and she has an art show that, that starts this Tuesday. She's a graphic designer and an art student there. She's a senior, and this is her big senior project. And the title of her art show is this, Reasons to Stay Alive. Reasons to Stay Alive. And a few months back, I, I, I shared a book by Matt Haig called Reasons to Stay Alive. And Matt Haig struggles with depression and anxiety, just like my daughter. And she embraced that book. She was the one who introduced it to me. I shared it with a bunch of you guys. Every artist at the show, at this, at this uh, presentation of their senior project, every artist that presents their stuff has an artist's statement. And this is Sarah's. It's what motivates her to draw. And I asked her if I could share, if I could share this with you. And this is a quote from Sarah's artist statement. Struggling with anxiety and depression for much of my life, my work has always been an outlet for me to channel the overwhelming feelings that come with grappling with mental health. My most recent work is a direct result of the summer of 2022, when I first intensely experienced suicidal ideation. As a way of coping with this tough new reality within my own mind, I began to create an ongoing list of things I am grateful for in the everyday the curation of small joys helped me grasp a sense of power in my own life. It allowed me to regain agency over my mind in the midst of the whirling thoughts I experienced during that time. While holding space for the varied experiences of those who are affected by mental illness, my work aims to speak personally to those struggling with their sense of identity and self-worth. My work centers on offering hope for those in pain through the practice of gratitude and the reiteration of truth. The repetitive, meditative quality of the text in my work reflects the desperate desire to cultivate goodness in the midst of hardship, in the midst of storms. The large-scale murals serve as a reflection of the freedom and boldness that bursts forth from healing and growth. You know, before my daughter, before we realized my daughter struggled with anxiety and depression, it was only four years ago as a freshman in college that, that it sort of came to a head, a big storm. Um, when you guys would come to me and share stories about your own depression, about your own anxiety or family members, I, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. I couldn't relate to it until it hit close to home. The importance of firsthand accounts 
the importance of living through stuff. It gives us authority to speak about things like depression or storms. When the storms hit, when the stuff hits the fan, we have two choices. And this is point number four. We have two choices when the storms hit. A, it can either soften our hearts, right? When the storms hit, it can either soften our hearts or it can harden our souls. It can either soften our hearts or it can harden our souls. The suffering that happens when the storms hit. When the storms hit, when the life or death storms hit, man, there is suffering and struggle and pain. It can either soften our hearts or it can harden our souls. And sometimes it does both. But I borrow this from John Ortberg. He says, let suffering soften your heart rather than harden your soul. There is no depth of soul without suffering. To the extent we have depth, we have also suffered. And he defines suffering as, as being humiliated or being humbled or failing or being embarrassed or losing it all. There is no depth of soul without suffering. To the extent that we have depth, we have also suffered. If you guys watched the playoff game last Sunday night, the late game, the Bengals and the Chiefs, if you watched that one guy who made that tackle, made that mistake out of bounds, tackled Mahomes out of bounds, personal foul, 15 yards, gave him enough yardage to kick that field goal, he was suffering at the end of that game. He was weeping because he knew he blew their chance to go to the Super Bowl. Talk about a guy suffering and struggling. There was one guy, one player that came alongside him and said, you know, it's going to be okay. But in that moment, man, he was struggling. He was hurting. To the extent that we have depth, we have also suffered. The two are inextricably connected. But it can go very different ways. It can make us deep. It can go two ways when we, when we suffer the storms. It can make us deep in understanding, empathy and forgiveness, or it can make us deep in resentment, bitterness, and vengeance. Lord, help me make the most of this. Lord, be with me in this storm and help me make the most of this. Please soften my heart or can harden our souls. Whose idea was this anyway? Who can I blame? This is not fair. It's stupid, stupid, stupid. I've shared this with you guys before. Most of my hardcore theology comes from bumper stickers. <laughs> and the one I saw this week was bless more, curse less. Bless more, curse less. The storms are coming, right? Or have already come, or you're, you're in one now. But how do we respond to the storms? Whose idea was this anyway? And not just the boat and the storm, but this whole following Jesus thing. I just want to share a quick story about uh, um, involved versus committed. Maybe you guys have heard this story before. An old story about being involved or committed. The farmer comes out to his barn. There's, there's a pig and some chickens there. The farmer says, tomorrow... Tomorrow we're having bacon and eggs for breakfast. The chicken, the chicken was involved. The pig was committed. Um, <laughs> point number five, if you're taking notes, involved versus committed. Think about this seriously. Up, up until this point, the disciples are involved. Now Jesus is asking them to commit. It's pretty easy so far, just some basic training. They all got the, the apostle employee handbook. Just high level stuff so far. Now they're in this storm. And everything, everything is being tested. And I share this picture with you guys. Um, this was me back in my engineering days. This is my buddy Bill. Um, he, was, he was committed to the project. I was involved. Just look how dirty my buddy Bill was and how clean. I, the only reason I got stuff on me because I hugged him when he came out of the tank. This was we were working on some... 200,000 gallon waste oil tank for Burlington Northern Santa Fe down by Coors Field and we had to fix something but he was committed to fixing it I was outside the tank like with an H2S meter saying hey you're, you're good Bill you're good you're good um, but the difference between being involved and being committed the apostles so far involved they're showing up Jesus begins to ask them though for skin in the game what it really means to follow Jesus to become more like Jesus Acts 2.42 reminds us what, what Jesus is asking them, asking us early church to commit to, what the first ch century church did. This is right out of the chute. Pentecost happens. Jesus has, has gone up to heaven. Holy Spirit comes down upon the church, and this is what the early church looked like, Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves 
the early church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They devoted themselves. They were committed to those things. And that's where I want to just sort of uh, wrap, begin to wrap up. That's our challenge. Are we, are we committed or are we just involved? Are we, are we just showing up or are we committed to following this Jesus and being changed to be more and more like Jesus? Going back to the four plus one, the four questions in the text plus the one I added. Verse 38, teacher, rabbi, don't you, don't you care if we drown? Don't you care? And I, and I imagine Jesus, I, I'm not sure if Jesus would do this, but, but I project Jesus. When he woke up, he rolled his eyes and said to himself, don't you, don't you think I care? I mean, as he watched healing of the folks, as he watched them driving out demons, as he showed compassion, as he lived out what it means to be loved. Don't you care, teacher, don't you care if we drown? You know, it was dark. It was really dark that night, and I can imagine how scary it was, especially when they thought they were going to lose it all. The scripture I just want to lift up is from, from John chapter 1. In Jesus was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And that's one of those scriptures that I just try to embrace when the storms come up in my life. I try to remember that in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Second point, verse 40, the first part of verse 40. And I think Jesus extends a bunch of grace to his disciples in this line, and I believe he extends it to us too. Why are you so afraid? That little word, so. Little word, so. I've shared it before. We're all a little scared. We're all a little scared, but less so when we're all together. From Psalm 23, and I share this almost at every celebration of life service we do in this building. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You are with me. You are in my boat. The second part of verse 40b, and maybe this is something we can all relate to. Do you still, in the scary times, do you still have no faith? Do you still have no faith? And that whole faith thing and our need just for a little, just a little bit of faith as small as a mustard seed. I believe the disciples struggled with this faith thing right to the end. And I believe that gives you and I, if we struggle with our faith, it gives us permission to struggle with it too. Last week, Pastor Grant talked about the, the seeds, the seeds thrown on the rocky soil, the, the, the seeds choked out by the thorns, but the seeds that finally land on good soil. And there's my new, one of my new favorite songs, Charity Gale. If you've never, never listened to her sing, she, someday when I get to heaven, I want to sing like Charity Gale, sort of the male version of that. But she has a song called, In the Field of Doubt, I'll plant a seed of faith. In the, seed, in the field of doubt, I'll plant a seed of faith. And that's scripture from Matthew's gospel. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, and I always want to say and remind folks, you don't even need a whole seed. Just take a half of a seed. And if you have a half a seed, we'll put our seeds together. And you can say to the mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And then that verse 41 after they fear for their lives in the storm, Jesus calms the storm. They were scared before. Now they're terrified. And they say to each other, not to God, not to Jesus, they say, who is this? Who is this? Even the wind and the waves listen to him. And again, up to this point, they're still trying to figure out who Jesus is. They do not get it. The demons get it, but nobody else. We know it. If you've read Mark's gospel, the first line in Mark's gospel, the, the, the writer Mark says, this is the story. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. And then he begins to tell the story. The only other person, the only other person that really gets who Jesus is, that he's the son of God. And it's crazy that this happens this way. It's the soldier, it's the centurion at the foot of the cross when Jesus breathes his last. The soldier says, surely this was the Son of God. And here's the plus one question. Whose idea was this anyway? Whose idea was this anyway? All of this following Jesus stuff, all of this God come breaking into our world through Jesus, it's all God's idea. It's all Jesus' idea. Not just the boat and the storms that we face. 
It's this whole following Jesus thing for the apostles and for us too. Are we just involved or are we really committed to following this Jesus? And here's two questions I just want us to fuss with at some level as we leave this place. Maybe as you're, you're driving along, driving away from here today or with a friend. Does God allow the storms in our lives on purpose? Does God allow the storms in our lives on purpose? When Jesus said to his disciples, let's go to, over to the other side. I mean, Jesus knew that the storm was going to come. He knew it was coming. Couldn't he have just waited till the morning? I mean, I'm a practical guy. I, I would have waited. Um, question number one, does Jesus allow the storms in our lives on purpose? And question number two, what do the storms in our lives teach us? What do they force us to do? You know, in this story, there were other boats that were crossing the lake with Jesus. There was one boat that had Jesus in it, but there were several other boats, the text says. And I can't imagine as this storm comes up and scares the bejesus out of these guys. Um, I mean, they're all battling for their lives. They're all fearing for their lives in the storm. And then that storm shuts off like magic. And I, I imagine the boats kind of huddle up and, and they all check on each other. Everybody okay? Everybody okay? Do we lose anybody? Everybody okay? And, and the ones in Jesus' boats, they say, you know what? You know what happened? I mean, Jesus was the one who said, quiet, be still, and the storm listened. And the guys in the other boats are saying, no, no way, no way, no way. The guys in Jesus' boat say, yeah, way, way. Um, l- last thought for today. Um, and I've been studying this from somebody who's a guru on relationships, especially marriages, John Gottman. I get this stuff from him. But he talks about a bid for connection. And that all of us, in some ways in our lives, we, we, we yearn to be connected. Yearn to be connected to something bigger than ourselves, but also to be connected in relationships with each other, with ourselves, but also in relationship with God. And, and John Gottman talks about it, it, that all of us experience bids for connection. And we can respond to those bids for connection in one of three ways. Somebody makes a bid for connection to us, we can, we can turn towards it, or we can be neutral toward it or ignore it, or we can turn against it. A, cu- a couple of examples. Somebody stops into your office at, at, at work and says, hey, you want to go grab a cup of coffee? You got, got a minute to grab a cup of coffee? And we say, yeah, I'm, I'm in. Or they pop their head in the office and, and they say, hey, can you, you have time for a cup of coffee? And you say, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. And that's sort of a neutral response. But then, then the last one, the against it is, somebody pops in and says, hey, you have time for coffee? And we say, push against can't you see how busy I am? Can't you see how busy I am? One, one other example, and I've got a lot of elbows about this this morning. Um, you're, you're at the coffee table, or you're at the kitchen table with your, your spouse. Um, your spouse sighs, just a heavy sigh. You, you, you lean in, you, you, you turn towards, and you say, hey, sweetie, what's, what's going on? Did you not sleep well last night? Or do you have a really big, big heavy day going on today? You know, what's, what's going on? Or your, your spouse sighs and you just ignore it. Just ignore it. Or your, your spouse sighs and you say, what is your problem? What is your problem? <laughs> and it seems like that happened sometimes recently in our church. But we, we have, we, when someone makes a bid for connection, we have three things we can do. We can either turn towards it or we can turn away from it or be neutral to it or we can turn against it. And I believe when, when the disciples said, teacher, don't you care? <laughs> and I really see Jesus in my mind rolling his eyes and say, I, I care so much. John 3.16 reminds us of how much God cares. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And all we have to do is turn towards him. All we have to do is believe in him. And we will have eternal life. I challenge you this week, when there are bids for connection in your life, challenge you. Look for those opportunities. Step in. And I also challenge you to look for the opportunities where God's saying, lean in. Lean in. Because it, sometimes it's so easy for me to just be neutral to those opportunities or to push against. Let me, let me pray us into communion.